Dr. Andrew Knoll is a professor of biology at Harvard University and the author of Life on a Young Planet, The First Three Billion Years of Life. In July of 2004, in an interview with PBS Nova entitled How Did Life Begin?, the following exchange took place. PBS, what do you think was the first form of life? Dr. Knoll, that's a good question. I can imagine that on a primordial earth, you would have replicating molecules, not particularly lifelike in our definition, but they're really getting the machinery going. Then some of them start interacting together and pretty soon you have something a little more lifelike and then it incorporates maybe another piece of nucleic acid from somewhere else and by the accumulation of these disparate strands of information and activity something that you and I would look at and agree that's biological would have emerged. PBS. So in a nutshell what is the process? How does life form? Dr. Knoll. The short answer is we don't really know how life originated on this planet. There have been a variety of experiments that tell us some possible roads, but we remain in substantial ignorance. That said, Dr. Knoll says, I think that what we're looking for is some kind of molecule that is simple enough that it can be made by physical processes on the young earth, yet complicated enough that it can take charge of making more of itself. That, I think, is the moment when we cross that great divide and start moving towards something that most people would recognize as living. Here is what Dr. Knoll has just said. Scientists can only imagine what happened with origins. They don't know. They are still in, quote, substantial ignorance. Something happened. A process started that had all the elements of intelligence and purpose. The words he used here were replicating molecules, getting the machinery going, interacting together, incorporating other pieces of information, taking charge of replicating itself. Something biological emerges. It is amazing how the evolutionist gets to use words associated with intelligence and design and creation, yet when a creationist uses these very same words, we are called ignorant. But Dr. Knoll speaks of crossing a great divide. The great divide to this whole question, when and how did life originate, is DNA, indisputably. Darwin wrote his theory in the 19th century when it was believed that a cell was just a homogeneous globule of protoplasm. Scientists did not know about DNA or the complex processes that go on inside of a cell. Today we know that there is no such thing as a simple cell. The amount of information in human DNA is roughly equivalent to 12 sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica, an incredible 384 volumes worth of detailed information. Yet in their actual size, which is only two millionths of a millimeter thick, a teaspoon of DNA could contain all the information needed to build the proteins for all the species of organisms that have ever lived on the earth and there would still be enough room left for all of the information in every book ever written. It's certainly reasonable to make the scientific inference that DNA is not the unpurposed product of unguided natural selection. Who or what could miniaturize such information and place this enormous number of letters in their proper sequences as a genetic instruction manual? Could evolution have gradually come up with a system like this? On top of all of this, we now know that DNA contains a very specific genetic language. For any string of information to be accurately called a language, it must contain the following elements an alphabet or a coding system, correct spelling, grammar, a proper arrangement of the words, and then meaning or semantics and an intended purpose. When those elements are together in a string of information, you have a language. Scientists have now discovered that the genetic code has all of these key elements. The coding regions of DNA have the very same properties as a computer code or a human language. The only other codes known to man to be true languages, by language definition, are all of human origin. 
Dogs, bees, and whales, for example, display elements of communication, yet none of these, nor any other life form on our planet, have the composition of a language. They are only considered low-level communication techniques. The only types of communication known to man to be considered high-level informational exchange are human languages, artificial languages created by humans, such as computer languages, and the genetic code. No other communication system known to man has been found to contain the basic characteristics of a language other than these. Additionally, recent studies in information theory have come up with some astounding conclusions, the most important of which is that information cannot be considered in the same category as matter and energy. It's true that matter or energy can carry information, but they are not the same as the information itself. For example, a book such as Tolstoy's War and Peace contains information. But is the physical book itself the information? No, the materials of the book, the paper, the ink, the glue, they contain the contents. But these materials are only a means of transporting the information within its contents. The same principle is found in the genetic code. The DNA molecule carries the genetic language but the language itself is independent of its carrier. The DNA molecule is the medium, it's not the message. It is like reading words, sentences, paragraphs, and chapters of a lengthy story of every living thing, each contained within its own book, perfectly bound, ready to be read and transformed into a living organism. We therefore have in the genetic code an immensely complex instruction manual that obviously is more intelligent than we humans ourselves in that it communicates a language, the language of life, that we are still learning how to read, yet it has been here from the beginning. And here is the evolutionary conundrum. How can meaningful, precise information come into existence by mutation and non-purposed natural selection? None of these processes contain the mechanism of intelligence and language transference, both of which are a requirement for creating complex information such as that found in the genetic code of DNA. Evolution has had its run for almost 150 years in the schools and universities and in the media. But now, with the discovery of what the DNA code is really all about, the complexity of the cell, and the fact that information is something vastly different from matter and energy, evolution can no longer dodge the ultimate outcome. The scientific evidence certainly points, scientifically speaking, more and more away from naturalistic evolution and toward resounding possibilities for an intelligent designer.